In minutes, it was over. I carried my son for nine months. 36 hours it took me to deliver my boy. But in minutes, a police officer killed him. Our reactions are dictated by the threat in front of us. If that person makes a decision and the result is a lethal force encounter, it may have been out of the officer's control. Uh, it's not something we go into looking for. It's something we train and prepare for. But that decision weighs heavily on every officer that wears the badge. Stop! Get on the ground! Both of you lay down on the ground! If you bring that up one more time, I will shoot you! Drop it! Oh, back your Put your hands, put your hands, behind your hands. Let me see your hands. Stop, stop, drop it. Put them down, drop it, put it down, put Guys, please don't. What we are seeing currently is that we are in a crisis. And the problem is it's multifaceted and it's very complex. In Arizona, 627 people were shot at by police from 2011 to 2018. 353 of those shot at were killed. During that time, Phoenix police shot at 212 people, killing 109 of them. Now, let's look at only 2018. 124 people were shot at by police across Arizona that year, and 63 of them died. Phoenix police shot at 48 people, killing 22 of them. Officer-involved shootings are very rare. Uh, most officers will go through, most officers will go through their entire career never having been involved in an officer-involved shooting, much less having to pull the trigger at a live target. In 2018, the Phoenix Police Department had 44 police shootings a 110% increase from the previous year, and more than any other police department in the United States. I won't say that we have a police shooting problem. So what Phoenix Police has is a culture where we've been self-reflective, where we're willing to look at training methods, where we're willing to engage the community and the public, where personally we took the bold step to invite an outside entity such as the National Police Foundation in to look at some of those whys. Phoenix Police Department commissioned a $150,000 report to examine what exactly was behind the dramatic increase in police shootings. So in 2018, as the chief uh, shared, we received a call uh, from her uh, indicating that um, there was a crisis and that help was needed and help was needed urgently. That study, conducted by the National Police Foundation, was unable to identify any root cause of the uptick in shootings, but it mentioned mental health, encounters with armed people, and tense community relations. Outlined in the report, however, were recommendations for Phoenix police, including documenting when an officer points a gun at a person, improving training, and examining alternative responses to people who suffer from a mental illness. Talking about the officer's life and the uh, person that they encounter. They're not looking at race. They're not looking at age, gender. They're not looking at anything other than they're not going to be able to diagnose a mental illness. They're trying to work through if there is an intoxication or an impairment there. The city has said that this is happening citywide, that there's no real trend. However, what we've seen is that the majority of the shootings have been in District 4, District 7, District 5 and District 8. And if you look at the demographics of those districts, the majority, it's people of color, is young people, is people with mental health issues. I don't know, I have a feeling that he, he was a little depressed. And they asked me, I think maybe he might have been depressed, that's why he was out there. I'm gonna switch out a picture because he has another one. And so like every, every three weeks, I switch out a picture. He was a big Broncos fan. He loved them. He was killed on the corner of Yale Street and 16. That's where we have the cross set up and 
flowers, candles. On December 24, 2017, police received a call about a man with a knife. Police say he attacked them after they arrived. 25-year-old Charlie Murillo was shot twice with stun bags before officers shot and killed him, they say. And they said that they have the right to kill when their lives are being in danger. I understand that part, but he was a human being. He was once a brother, he was an uncle, a son. He, he had his girlfriend and not even an apology, no apology, at least from the police officer that did this, you know? A news uh, broadcast that they did said um, something about, we eliminated, eliminated the problem. Those words are really hard to hear. Eliminated the problem. What happened to assessing the situation? <laughs> One of the things within the law and in the Supreme Court overall is that they've allowed officers to say that if they feel threatened, they can shoot, right? And so it's really easy to say that. There's really nothing that you have to prove except that you felt threatened. And data show that 89% of people shot at by police from 2011 to 2018 were armed, usually with guns. But the definition of armed is defined by the officer. Officers determine when they arrive at a scene whether or not a person is armed with something that poses a risk to an officer or the public. That can include anything from a set of barbecue tongs to a wine bottle or an officer's own handcuffs. What I would want the community to understand is that we are human. We're doing the best that we can given the training and experience that we have. Your concerns are our concerns as well. Uh, unfortunately, officer-involved shooting does not tell the entire picture. The truth is police shootings and the relationship law enforcement has with the public is complicated. No justice! No peace! No justice! No peace! No justice! No peace! No justice. No peace. One of the things that we've come to find out is that the shootings are happening within minutes, sometimes within less than three minutes. And so what that shows us is that there is a lack of de-escalation and a lack of seeing the humanity in those moments and de-escalating a situation. Our thoughts are with the families of the people who we encounter. Where our thoughts are with the families of the people whose loved ones didn't survive a police encounter. And I guarantee that is going to stay with that officer, probably with that officer's partner, with that officer's supervisor, stays with us as an apartment, we as a community continue on. We're going to live and work and play around that person's family. I always say if I could, if I, if I could have one more day with my son, I'd give up my life for him. <laughs> in 2019, Phoenix Police Department was involved in nine shootings through May 29th. Eight of those were fatal. Mom, what time do you get out of work? I'm gonna be hopping on the bus. If anything, I'll be back tomorrow, all right? I love you. Bye, Mom. See how he pauses and then he says, bye, Mom. Just, that's all I have left. His ashes and this recording to live for the rest of my life. We will be back again. We are here to listen we are here to come back with this community. We are here to make change. And... Real change doesn't start with the police department. Real change starts with our community. There are those of you who think when I say community, I don't mean the police department. The police department is a part of this community. The, the community is a part of this police department. So in spite of the angst, in spite of the, the shouts, in spite of the emotion, I hear what you say. I am listening to what you say. You don't have to believe me. At the end of the day though, the proof is in the pudding. The proof is in what happens after this meeting, and as we said, this is not the last of these meetings.